questions today. Um, everyone is on mute. So when we get to the Q&A part, um, if you have questions, you'll need to take yourself off mute with star six. Um, you can also, during the presentation, you can drop your questions in the chat and I'll be monitoring that and bring those forward um, towards the end. So feel free to engage with us there. Um, today's presentation is One Country, Thousands of Flavors. And I'm super excited about this because, I mean, I love chocolate. Doesn't I, I think most people who are here probably love chocolate, but I think the best part of today is we're going to learn about chocolate. You know, it's great to eat it, but let, what are the things we don't know? Um, so today we have Rizek Cacao with us, um, two individuals. We have Daisy Polenko and Max Wax. Um, they are uh, in the Dominican Republic, Rizek is. I'm gonna go to the um, slide and tell you a little bit about um, Rizek and uh, what they're doing in the Dominican Republic. And then we'll let, turn it over to them and let them talk a little bit about uh, cacao and chocolate and what they're doing in the Dominican Republic. Um, so a little bit of background about Rizik. They are a cacao grower, processor, and exporter. They were founded in the Dominican Republic in 1905. And kind of going along with our National Hispanic Heritage theme, they're run by a fifth-generation family, which I think is fabulous, right? Let's talk about um, the heritage of some of our Hispanic and, and Latin American and South American countries. Um, so we're super excited to have them. Little known fact, the Dominican Republic accounts for 60% of the organic cocoa volume in the world. Um, and that's super impressive considering that the Dominican Republic is the 69th smallest country in the world. So um, Dominican Republic heritage folks, you know, raise your hand uh, virtually in the chat if you'd like. For many families in the Dominican Republic, cocoa farming is a generational legacy and you'll hear a little bit about that today. Uh, Rizek owns 25 farms on the island and contracts, contracts with another 2,500 small farmers. So really an integral part of the Dominican Republic's um, economy and their livelihood there. So we'll hear some more about that. In 2007, Rizek began making bars for the consumer market, sold only in the Dominican Republic, but now they're available um, in the United States and they have a flagship store um, that they opened in New York last year. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that and how you can buy some at the end. They produce uh, chocolate bars in the United States under the brand Cacao. Um, they offer farm to bar chocolates. And I was actually reading on their website, they have a pretty cool um, chocolate experience if you're um, maybe after COVID passes and we're able to travel again and get to New York City or if you're not that far away. One of Rizik's biggest projects to date has been this concept store, and they really kind of envisioned it as a place where chocolate lovers and chocolate makers can immerse in cacao and the whole chocolate experience, and you can learn and enjoy and touch and smell and feel. And so um, I think it's really interesting that they've um, initiated that. So. We've got two presenters, like I said, we've got Daisy, um, who is the project coordinator at Rizik. She's a lawyer specializing in corporate communications and corporate social responsibility. She's got experience in project management um, in various companies um, and industries in the Dominican Republic and Switzerland, and has worked in the cacao and chocolate industry since 2017. Max is also with us today um, from Rizek, and Max is the VP of Strategy and Business Development. Um, he was born in Italy and grew up in Brazil, so interesting combination there. Um, but that's where he first became acquainted with cocoa. He spent his uh, childhood in Brazil, but eventually began his career trading uh, cocoa. And after working in several Central African nations as a buyer and exporter of cocoa and coffee, he moved to the Dominican Republic about 20 years ago, where he's been dedicated to the modernization of the cocoa sector and production of chocolate. Um, so we're super excited to have them here today. Um, Daisy, Max, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing here and let you guys kick off your presentation. Thank you very much, Brittany. Hello, everyone. On my behalf, Max and Daisy Polanco, who are here with me today. And thank you very much to all of you for, for attending this, this presentation. And we are very uh, excited to share with you our, our, our knowledge and our experience in, in, in cacao. Uh, well, I, I, can you see our, our screen? Is it working well? Yep, we can see it good, Max. Okay, very, very good. Um, th this is basically a description of, of one country, the Dominican Republic, and how our legacy, our experience, what we have learned in cacao, translates into flavors. One of the, of the main paradigms that we have when we talk about one country is that we think that 
every country represents one type of cocoa and only one flavor. And this is actually not true. I can go to our second slide. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is the table of, of contents. So good morning, everyone. This is uh, Daisy on behalf of Rezac as well. Some of the topics that we're going to touch on today are basically cacao in the Dominican Republic, how we work with cacao farmers directly, our history and legacy, of course, being in the middle of National Hispanic Heritage Month, very important. We're also going to talk about the delicious subject of the experience of chocolate. Then we'll talk about some myths in the cacao and chocolate industry, and then we'll have some time for Q and A's. Okay, the importance of cacao in the Dominican Republic is huge. 40% uh, of our green canopy of our forests are basically made of cacao. The Dominican Republic doesn't have a primary forest like Brazil, Colombia, or Ecuador. So whatever is green has been planted. And what was planted is basically is basically cacao. Uh, the other part of the island, which belongs to Haiti, is very sadly uh, deforestated, and the major difference is really represented by cacao. That is why even a Green Forest Alliance considers a cacao as as forest in in the DR for this very unusual and peculiar importance it has in our in our country. Okay, uh, cacao production is distributed throughout the country. There you have the detail in municipalities, provinces, and five different regions, which means that out of seven regions, five uh, have, have cacao. So it, it is important nationwide. As concerns, as concerns the ownership, it's, it's largely a uh, small holder base where uh, 40,000 farms belong to 35,000 families and the average size is close to 2.7 hectares. There are notable uh, exceptions in the Cibao region, which is basically in, in the center of the two mountain chains that you can see uh, in the northern part, where uh, you have an ownership of medium size, let's say seven to 10 hectares per family, which is also very important for the sustainability uh, of the farms since a, a small a small holder base of two two hectares per family is actually very difficult to to be maintained and to guarantee a, a decent uh, household income well this is the most important uh, or, or perhaps interesting part of the, of the dominican republic there was no cacao in the dominican republic it's not an endemic tree it's not like in, in Mexico or Ecuador or Brazil, where it is native to those countries. And this is one of its advantages, because that means that cacao was brought in several historic waves or phases into the Dominican Republic by the ruling power. So at the beginning, it was the Spaniard who brought cacao from other colonies in, in Latin America, uh, in Ecuador, uh, Colombia, and Venezuela, which also belonged to them. So uh, from the, the 16th until the 18th century, there have been waves of importation of genetic material from all Latin America. Later on, the local governments, uh, when the Dominican Republic became independent, also brought cacao in from other countries uh, in, in the Caribbean, Trinidad and, and Tobago, uh, Costa Rica, and Mexico, which means that basically in the DI, you can find the entire uh, genotypes, all the, all the different varieties that are present in basically every country in the world. Now, the taste in general uh, of the Dominican cacao reflects this resourcefulness and this extreme variety of genotypes, and uh, the most notable note is fruitiness. But this is just uh, let's say a general average of the country, but if you're able to separate, to pick and choose and to do varietal planting, you have several different flavors where, for example, you can find what is normally associated to a Ecuadorian type of flavor, which is the, the floral notes in some types. In other, you can find 
uh, nutty and almond-like notes, which are normally associated with cacao from Venezuela. Uh, you can find uh, tobacco and woody notes, which are normally associated with cacao from Grenada and Trinidad and Tobago and so forth. But when you mix that all up and you don't separate uh, the different, you know, let me use this expression, vineyards uh, of cacao, then the prevailing note is fruitiness. So just to jump in here real quick, this is um, to really highlight how much influence we see of the actual cacao fruit in the final chocolate bars, because all of these varieties and flavors that Max is describing, this is specifically in the fruit. This is way before we get to consume a chocolate bar. Okay, now we're gonna um, speak a little bit about the history and legacy of this uh, company. So um, Rizek is a family owned company and it's been in the cacao industry since 1905. So Rizek has been known obviously for its passion in cacao, not only in the, in the production, but in the growth, processing and export of this um, product. And most of the farms are located in the heart of the Dominican Republic and are of course distinguished by the excellence in our genetic material and our extraordinary post-harvest treatment. Here you can see some pictures of the Rizek family and um, just to highlight how much the family has been involved in this uh, family business. Yeah, Nadia uh, should have been here in my place, but she's getting married soon, so she had to go to Puerto Rico to solve some bureaucratic problems. So forgive her and bear with me. But we do have a video of Nadia, which we'll display now, so you can also see the importance and the heritage aspect. See if we can. Uh, okay, here it goes. Can you see the the YouTube video? Nope. It looks like it's a gray screen. Uh, okay, let me see if I have to share a different screen. Yes. Okay. Yep, we can see it now. Good. Okay. En el 1905, mi bisabuelo empezó a plantar cacao y desde entonces mi familia ha llevado el cacao en la sangre. Para nuestra familia siempre ha sido una tradición. Daisy and Max, I think we lost audio. Compartimos con ustedes el legado y tradición del cacao y el chocolate. Welcome to Cacao New York. Okay, I don't know if you need us to replay it. I didn't know if we need the screen uh, or mute the video. Why don't we drop the link in the chat box and then everybody's got it and they can access it as we kind of keep going. Good. Okay, perfect. I'll do that. And let's sure. go on, put it on the chat. There it is. And we'll get back to the presentation. Okay, let me know as soon as you see it. Okay. There it is. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, now we wanted to speak a little bit about how we uh, work directly with cacao farmers. So we have uh, created and sponsored, Rizek has, this, um, the Fuparoka Foundation, which is the foundation for social assistance, rehabilitation, and organic handling of cocoa plantations. Um, Fuparoka is an independently managed nonprofit 
and uh, supported by RESEC, which provides technical assistance to all of the affiliated farmers. And we'll speak a little bit about the specific work we do with. Okay, well, it was founded in actually in 1998 as a response to the devastating Hurricane George and its effects. George basically swept away 70% of the production back then. And uh, most of the players were faced to an alternative. Either you, you leave the business and abandon cacao, or you have to heavily invest in it in order to recover the farms. And that was the choice made by the RISA company back then. And uh, actually, that was the moment when I got involved, first got involved in uh, with, with the RISAX as they introduced a very uh, ambitious project in, in Washington to the IADB exactly to fund the, the Kuparoka, which by then was called the Paroka Project. It was part of the company. And so I was called by the World Bank as an advisor and an auditor to check if that made any sense. And as you can see, 22 years later, I'm still here, so it did make some sense. So some of the <laughs> programs that we handle with Kuparoka um, include community investments. And we also do this with some of our strategic partners. So we also receive donations from some of our partners. Among, this, among the projects that we handle are um, building schools in small rural communities. We provide school supplies for these schools and for the children. Uh, you know, we try to improve farmers' livelihoods with these programs. We provide first aid kits and water filters in communities where they're most needed. But of course, this is not the only thing we do. We also have um, a series of training programs for cacao farmers uh, to implement directly in their farms. So we help them with soil management practice, pest control in organic farms, waste management, occupational health, and also reforestation programs. And we have a, another video for you guys. So you can see one of these uh, cacao farmers speaking. Okay, so now I have to change. Let me share this other screen with you guys and let us know if you can see it. Yep, we can see it. De la esmeralda, nacer cacao, como un regalo que trae la aurora. Vamos paseando. Por el sendero, como un regalo que trae la aurora. Mi nombre es José Núñez, tengo 11 años trabajando aquí en la Hacienda La Emeralda. Yo me levanto todos los días a las 6 de la mañana, huelo un café, me tomo mi cafecito, ahí espero los trabajadores que lleguen, luego nos vamos a la plantación, a cortar el cacao, a cortar la hierba y así por el estilo. Mi día a día es eso, cosechar cacao y trabajar la hierba. Es, lo primero es que hay que mantenerla de chuponada. Luego hay que cortar algunas ramas, hay que podar para que el cacao pueda tener buena cosecha, para que no ataquen las enfermedades como los hongos y cosas así. Nacer cacao, como un regalo que trae la aurora. Aquí el cacao, en, en Mava, puede saber a, a algo cítrico, como el guineo, eh, guanábana. Vamos paseando. La aurora. Eh, la época de cosecha es abril, mayo, junio. Esa es la temporada alta. La temporada baja es eh, octubre, noviembre y diciembre. Ahí se cosecha el 20%. Nice. Okay. Um, All right. 
Um, some of the other uh, training programs include preservation of species that are found in these cacao farms mm -hmm. and the conservation of natural resources. Yeah, among the, the animals that are protected, we find, in, for example, some types of, of snakes. Uh, and that are endemic to the Dominican Republic. Yes, and the, those are very important because they are natural enemies of, of rats. So by preserving the snakes, you avoid the rats. And the rats right now are the major pest in Dominican cacao. And it is calculated that they eat uh, approximately 15% of our harvest. So it's a big deal. Uh, and the snakes uh, culturally are, are a problem because farmers do not like to have snakes in their, in their fields. Of course, they're not venomous snakes. They are in, of the boa family, and they're small, one and a half meters approximately. <laughs> so rather than using and, and then, uh, of course, the birds. chemicals, mm -hmm. um, we kind of have to allow the ecosystem to, to work mm -hmm. naturally. <laughs> um, and just to kind of sum up, this really um, represents the responsibility and accountability that we uh, really take into account as a company uh, because we also help these cacao farmers obtain the different organic certifications. So obviously these, re these certifications represent the commitment to these um, values and good practices which are crucial to sustainability. And we take into consideration ethical and environmental responsibility, uh, labor laws, sustainability, and of course traceability. And in this respect, the certifications are just a means to an end. They are not an end in themselves. So I see some questions popping up, but I don't know if you'd like us to stick with the Q&A at the end or answer them as they pop up. I've, I'm making a list. So as we get to Q&A portion, I'll bring them forward and we can answer them all then. Okay. All right. So now we'll talk a little bit about innovation and processing and how our passion for Cacao also translate in, translates into our passion for quality. Yeah, so one of the key elements to build a value is knowledge. And that is that is a, that is valid in every field and also in cacao. So it's not sufficient to care about something, but you have to know about something. And we found ourselves at the beginning of the 2000s with basically a clean slate. It was really uh, we were just really perpetuating a tradition that had remained more or less equal since the 16th century without any progress, either at farmer level or at processing level. So we tried to uh, make up for this lack of, of knowledge by starting uh, from scratch a very uh, important project with university and research centers worldwide. Uh, we had scientists working with us and still have uh, Several PhDs have been written inside our facilities. We have laboratories. We really invested very much in, uh, in basic science. And uh, thanks to this increase accrued knowledge, we were able also to modify the processing of, of our cacao. So here you can see some of our uh, key driving factors, which Max is touching upon as well. Uh, we have R&D departments for both cacao and chocolate. We have tasting panels for both as well. We develop strategic partnerships with our clients and we have one of the most state-of-the-art post-harvest centers where we produce um, distinctive cacao recipes. Here you can see some of the images from our center located in the heartland of Dominican cacao, which is the Duarte province, specifically in uh, San Francisco de Macorís very well known for, for the production of cacao. Yes, that could be a subject perhaps for also for another, uh, another seminar or a webinar, but basically we uh, modified, we changed, we improved the way of processing the cacao from the very pod up to the end. And one of the key words that Daisy just mentioned is, is flexibility and made to measure. We are able to process a, the, our smallest batch as, as small as 280 kilos and make it absolutely distinctive. Whereas we also have customers of uh, a thousand, a thousand tons as well, and we can make a thousand tons according to a specific recipe or 280 kilos. 
We also have a video on our process. Um, if, if you want, Brittany, we can share it on the chat as well and people can have a look afterwards. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Here we have some more pictures of our uh, machines in the processing center. Mm -hmm. Well, in one way, if we have been very forward looking and very modernist in the processing of our cacao from wet beans uh, up to the up to the fermented beans, on the contrary, we have been a reactionary or a let's say con very conservative in the processing of cacao. Because we realize that if a cacao bean is perfect, there is very little you need to do it in order to make it a great chocolate. So it's basically uh, not over processing. Just roasting our roaster is a refurbished uh, Bueller from the late 60s. And then in the previous picture, you saw a melanger, perhaps dating to the, uh, back to the 50s. And you just need minimal, minimal transformation in order to turn uh, cacao into chocolate. It's just a sheer uh, power, uh, sugar, and time. Not much more than that. And some heat. Well, this is a flow pack machine, which we have one uh, inside our uh, also inside our store in in Brooklyn. This is the only modern touch, just because we believe that a foil uh, preserves a chocolate better than, than than just folded paper. So I know Brittany also wanted us to touch base a little bit on uh, what we can obtain from cacao. It's not just chocolate. There's a series of sub products that are used in the chocolate industry as uh, raw materials. And um, we're gonna, I'm gonna just quickly go over them. Uh, so we have on, we have cacao nibs. Nibs are rich in antioxidants and they also work for mood improvement. They can be used to control blood pressure and glucose levels on the human body. And um, commercially nibs are becoming more and more popular. They are sold already as individual products, and um, they're also used as inclusions for yogurts, ice creams, uh, chocolate itself too, um, and many other uh, products, also for pancakes. These are kind of like replacing the, the traditional chocolate chips. Uh, we also have cacao powder and cacao butter. So the powder is the result of extracting the liquid and buttery parts of cacao when it's being processed. And this organic dark powder has no added sugars. It's very popular for you know, baking um, these different sweet treats that we're accustomed to. Uh, the butter possesses extremely unique characteristics. It's used in the, cos in the cosmetics industry, in the pharmaceutical industry. It's probably one of the most noble vegetable fats, and it contains most of the antioxidant properties of cacao. Yeah, by the way, we're also making uh, soap uh, by using a cocoa butter as a fatty base. Another aspect that we really wanted to speak about with you guys was how we determine quality from um, just the simplicity of the label on a chocolate bar. Some of the key elements that should always be in the chocolates you're consuming, uh, you can see here on this wheel, which are certifications, cacao content, the origin or the source of your raw material the, of the cacao. A lot of people are including tasting notes or flavor profiles. Um, lot and batch numbers can also indicate that the chocolate maker is really taking into account traceability and of course the ingredients. Other elements that craft chocolate makers are including are um, description about their process, descriptions about their the farms that where the cocoa comes from, and any recognition or awards that they might have received for their chocolate bars. Here you can see um, the front and back side of one of our labels where we first mention the specific estate where the cacao comes from uh, for the production of this specific chocolate bar, which is La Esmeralda. Uh, we mention that it is a single estate chocolate bar. We highlight the dominant features of the flavor. We speak about the flavor profile of this specific chocolate bar. 
Um, if we take a look at the ingredients in the second label, you can see how it's really minimal, but to the point, and it's all organic ingredients. Uh, we have our certification and an award that was won in 2013 by the by the estate and the cacao produced in this estate. So very, very simplistic and to the point. Yes, and we are. This is a very special type of chocolate because the same beans are also sold to other very reputable chocolate makers. So it is our interpretation. Let's say it's a sort of authentic interpretation. We are also the land landowners and, and the farmers. Uh, Felklin in Switzerland buys some of this cacao and has his version of it, which is very good. Barry Kalebaut also uh, came out with their interpretation of our uh, La Esmeralda. Um, and, then, and then it's ourselves and we make it either uh, also in, uh, in, in the DR and in New York. And let me tell you that the version that you're seeing is the New York version, and I think it is probably superior to all the others. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Including the big guys. Including the big guys. Um, and then now we want to speak a little bit about uh, myths in the cacao and chocolate industry. So the first thing that we like to flat out clarify is that one country does not mean one flavor. So here we discuss a lot about single origin and how different regions in one country can produce distinctive flavors. This is tied to the terroir. The terroir combines climate, soil, landscape, and microorganisms that eventually affect the, the cacao as a fruit. Mm -hmm. um, the taste of the beans is definitely affected by the environment in which they're grown. Yes, and then by the genetics. It's, it's the same, the same happens to, to us human beings. We are the sons and daughters of our father and our mother. And we, uh, of course, inherit much of the genetics from, from, from them. But then we develop differently depending on where we grow. Uh, so if, if, if I grow in, in Africa or in Alaska, I'll have different a, 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 diff, a different version of myself, and exactly the same happens happens to cacao. So we we have the chance in the Dominican Republic of, of having really different and distinctive terroirs on one side, and then all the genetic richness that we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So if you combine all these parameters, you have a very wide array of flavors and tastes that can be achieved. Yeah, so cacao is definitely join, joining the realm of, uh, for example, specialty coffee, olive oil, and wine, where depending on the regions of the country and obviously the post-harvest uh, process or just the processing of the product can really bring out distinctive uh, flavor profiles. So the second myth that we hear a lot in the industry is that a higher percentage in a, in a chocolate bar equals a higher quality. So that, no, this is not necessarily true. Percentage in a chocolate bar indicates the proportion of cacao. So cacao as a cacao mass and cacao butter that a single chocolate bar contains. It doesn't indicate the origin of the cacao. It doesn't indicate the quality of the cacao. And it doesn't indicate the producers or the processors uh, process or know-how. So this is, you know, so now you guys are aware that this is not necessarily true. Uh, another one very similar is that a higher percentage means that this is bitter chocolate. This is not true. As we've been discussing, flavor is influenced by the place of origin and the post-harvest treatment. So cacao in one region can be very acidic and uh, cacao from another region can be sweet and you know just so many different flavors can come about so no a higher percentage does not necessarily mean that the chocolate will be more or less bitter well white chocolate uh, is is chocolate yes it is but it's a different type of chocolate as it does not contain cocoa solids basically a uh, cacao uh, white chocolate is made just of cocoa butter 
where all the solids have been squeezed out with milk milk solids vanilla and and sugar so we shouldn't be perhaps too uh, Taliban's about this, but uh, we have to be aware that it's a different type of chocolate. Let's say a depleted type of chocolate. So, so white chocolate is is chocolate. It's just it just doesn't have that pigmentation of the cacao with the cacao base that we're used to seeing in the regular chocolate. Yeah, but we're seeing more and more chocolate producers who do not uh, use deodorized butter, which means that the butter still. Uh, brings some of the flavors that pertain to the, to the beans. And in, in that case, uh, let's say it will be a richer experience for a white chocolate. So if you are to eat white chocolate, look for ones made with non-deodorized butter. And now we want to talk about the experience of chocolate. So how do we taste chocolate? To taste chocolate, we have to use our five senses. We have to look at the chocolate bar, we have to listen to the snap of a chocolate bar, we can feel the texture of the chocolate bar, we can taste the flavor of a chocolate bar, and we can smell the aroma and the flavor profile, the aromatic aspect of a yeah. chocolate bar. It is important to point out that the flavor comes first. The flavor is the basic taste that you feel just in your tongue. It's just sweet, uh, sour, uh, bitter, and, and umami. Mommy is like a protein-like type of flavor. But then you have all the aromas that develop in your nose just afterwards. So the flavor is one thing, and the aroma is the reaction of our nose to the finer, to the finer flavors and finer particles, uh, aromatic particles that are contained in cacao. So the idea is to let the cacao melt slowly in your mouth, perceive the basic flavor, including the, the umami, and then have your nose do the rest of the job and recognize all the, the, the finer the finer notes. Yeah, and it's important also to um, discuss taste. So what is taste? Taste is not the same as eating. When we taste, we have to focus and pay attention on what our senses are telling us. We can perceive properties in food thanks to our senses. So we have to let ourselves kind of be guided by this complete experience that is chocolate. There is no right or wrong answer, and the differences that we have we will make the experience even more interesting, even more enriching. Um, and regarding smell, we can go so far as to saying um, the sense of smell is um, connected also to our memories. Mm -hmm. So certain memories can remind us, remind us of specific smells, smells and vice versa. So if you haven't tasted a tropical fruit, you might not perceive that when you taste a chocolate, but other people might. So we might know right away, as we live in the Dominican Republic, what the, you know, we could obtain the flavor of like soursop as soon as we taste a chocolate bar. But someone that has never tasted this is mm -hmm. not going to get this flavor. Exactly. The descriptors to... Uh characterize a chocolate experience are very much linked to the culture of the person who tastes. So perhaps in uh, in the U.S. you can easily use a, a peach as, as a descriptor to a specific taste, whereas in the Dominican Republic that would be uh, translated into guanabana and guineo or something like that. But it is very important, as Daisy indicated, to look back into your memory and to your limbic system of, of, of your brain and, and try to associate the different flavors that one after the other will come up to your memory through your senses. So what should we look for with our senses? So initially we looked at the color of the chocolate bar. Um, we can feel the resistance of the chocolate bar, the shape. This will let us know if the chocolate bar has been well preserved, if it's been taken care of. We can listen to the snap, which will let us know about the freshness and if it's been well stored. We can um, taste the flavor flavor delivery and distinguish what is the mouthfeel of a specific chocolate bar. And then we can differentiate the, the various aromatic notes with our sense of smell. Yes, uh, I just want to add that the preservation is key. Uh, do not store it in the fridge or you'll have sugar bloom, so the sugar will separate from, 
from the rest of, of, of the mass. Uh, you perhaps might not know that sugar is never dissolved into the chocolate because the sugar just dissolves into watery solutions. So it is a, in a very unstable suspension. And if we change the, the structure of the, allow the temperature to change the structure of our chocolate, then the sugar will migrate. So never freeze it and never melt it. It should be preserved at a temperature between 12 uh, degrees Celsius up to maximum of 24. Be from the 30s and no, our 40s to 70s Fahrenheit, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and, and then the, the flavor delivery is also very important that it will tell you if the chocolate maker has done a good job. If the chocolate is too refined, probably a refined in a, in a bowl meal, for example, you have a muddy sensation in your mouth, it will stick to your tongue and palate, and you have a hard time swallowing it properly. So this is too fine, and this does not allow for a proper delivery of flavor. On the contrary, if it is too grainy or sandy, uh, unless it's a, uh, let's say, Mexican type of, of experience, it means that the chocolate maker has not done a good job in refining it. So as you can see, chocolate tasting has become a world in its own, and obviously nowadays there are so many uh, courses that are uh, aimed at this experience, um, ranging from beginner level to the expert level. Mm -hmm. So I really advise you all to at least do a beginner level course because once you really learn how to taste a chocolate bar, you're able to enjoy, obviously enjoy it in a, in a different way mm -hmm. and to really appreciate yeah. uh, the entire process that goes into the making of a chocolate bar. Yeah, but choose a proper teacher. There are many <laughs> self-proclaimed experts who really are yes, not. So yes. <laughs> look, at, look at their CVs and do you a sort of due diligence before you get schooled by somebody with no authority. <laughs> this is also true. <laughs> and um, so now we are towards the end of the presentation and now we move on to the Q&As. Thank you, Max and Daisy. Um, we've gotten a lot of really good comments um, in the chat. Um, I wanna give a shout out to Cadence because um, she's been super engaged and given us great questions. So I'm gonna kick us off with um, going back to earlier in the presentation, kind of a foundational question. How long does it take to a for a cacao plant to grow and mature? Okay, from the time you plant a seed, you need three months uh, for it to become what we call a, a rootstock. Then you can graft it. You have to keep it then two months in a nursery for it to recover after this sort of surgery. And then you are, we are at month six, you take it to the fields and you have to wait two more years before you see the first part. So best case scenario, three years. In the case of non-grafted cacao, it takes four to five years. So that's a pretty long timeline, which I think gives some visibility into sometimes the pricing of cacao and some of the cacao products, because that that is a long time for harvest, unlike other products that are kind of planted and then harvested year over year. Yes, yes. So is it true that there is a cacao shortage? Uh, there is a good cacao shortage, but not a shortage in general, as the the market uh, reacts uh, to to the demand in a pretty uh, elastic manner. So the African countries and even Ecuador are able to to supply all the the raw material for the market. What is in shortage, as I said, is the fine cacao and the differentiated cacao and the, the, the different varietals. And so um, uh, some questions about like growing. What about, um, where does cacao grow? It looks like from the pictures, it's pretty mountainous. And so mountainous areas, and then what type of landscape does cacao thrive in? Well, it, it, it actually can be planted anywhere uh, in, uh, in our country, in the Dominican Republic, for example, it was first planted in, in the mountainous areas just because 
the most expensive flatlands was used for other cultures such as rice or, or cattle. Um, you can see now the most modern farms in Ecuador, for example, are in flatland and so are there in, uh, in, in, in Colombia. So it's not necessarily in, in the mountains. Uh, one of the advantages of the mountains is that drainage is more, is more effective, but drains can be made also in flatlands. The only prerequisites for planting cacao is a minimum temperature of 12 degrees Celsius. It cannot go below that and uh, and a, a, at least 2,000 millimeters of rainfall, either provided by the rain or supplemented by irrigation. And also important to highlight that um, on, a, on a worldwide level, um, cacao is grown into in the, in the region referred to as the cacao belt, which is 20, degree, 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of the equator. So you touched a little bit on rainfall and we did have a question about that. How it is a cacao kind of plant that needs a lot of water or is it something that, that can do pretty well in a um, drier environment? Cacao needs water. Uh, ideally, it should be evenly distributed uh, during the year, but in reality, it's never so. Uh, it can withstand up to three months drought, but not more than that. And uh, in uh, the present situation of uh, climate change, it's uh, really a challenge for new farmers and also for, the, for older farmers. And we are seeing that there is, there is a phenomenon of desertification uh, in, uh, in most of, of, of Latin America. And uh, I believe, we believe that irrigation will be the key to uh, sustainability of new cocoa farms. So similarly, you know, knowing that it takes so long for a cacao plant to really go from seedling to harvesting, how do you know when it's ready to be harvested? Well, every variety uh, follows a very specific pattern of uh, maturity and ripeness of its fruits. Uh, we know all these uh, patterns and so recognize them by color and shape but they're not all equal. Some cacao pods are ripe when they are uh, red, uh, others are ripe when they're yellow, other uh, become orange, and some other simply are a, of a different tone of, of green. So you really have to know what you have planted in order to decide when the, the pod is ripe. So I think we got some good feedback too in some of the earlier pictures. Um, folks had not really seen the inside of a cacao plant before. I think people have probably seen, you know, the brown beans roasted and stuff like that. And I think because it goes to that chocolate color, people had not really seen, you know, when you open it up, it's, it's white inside. And so Cadence mentioned, you know, wow, it's white. But Bo was talking about, um, it, you know, is it really like a giant seed pod? It kind of looked like when they were being cut open, they were, um, giant seed pods, and, and what does it taste like when you eat just that kind of raw fruit? Well, uh, there are seeds uh, between 30 and 50 inside uh, every pod. Uh, Daisy is trying to accommodate a picture to show you. Uh, okay, ju you just this. a second. Eh? You guys can get the whole picture. All right. Can you, can you see the pod? Yes, very well. Okay. Then those are seeds. Uh, and there is a, a whitish pulp stuck to them. So what you actually eat is the whitish pulp, and it is vaguely citrusy and very, uh, very pleasant. You do not chew the seeds because they're very, very bitter. Uh, this, this whitish pulp becomes the, the, the fuel for the fermentation. As soon as you open the pod, as it is like that, all the, the yeasts and bacteria that are a, on the outer surface of, of the pod migrate to the interior and start eating the, the sugars, producing alcohol, CO2, and other aromatic precursors. So the, the magic of flavor begins in that very moment when the, the knife opens up, opens up the pod. 
but you can eat that raw pulp and it, it tastes pretty good, it sounds like. It, it, it tastes very, very good. And in some places in Brazil in particular, uh, farmers extract part of that pulp before fermenting the, the cacao. Little bit to the detriment of the quality of fermentation, but they also sell this uh, centrifuged uh, cacao juice, which is very pleasant. So Bo mentions that he heard, and Max, you're a European, so here you go, that Europeans consider milk chocolate an abomination. Do the producers, what's the view of this, I guess, in the Dominican Republic and for Rizek? No, no, it's not an abomination. Oh, these are exaggerations that come up when uh, there is a, a movement. You know, all, movement and, all movements at the beginning are radical, but how can you tell that it is an abomination? Abomination is a bad product. But if you have a, a fantastic milk, well, well done, uh, German or Swiss or from Wisconsin, uh, mixed in, in good proportions with a good chocolate, why not? We should not be exclude, we should include. I think that's a good point, right? Because you can have really bad all kinds of chocolate, not just milk, but you can have bad chocolate from anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can have good chocolate from anywhere, right? And I think that's the point. Absolutely. Well, if you just look at the, the label uh, of a chocolate, then you realize if they're trying to mask the flavor of their ingredients by adding too many things or not. Basically, you have to be true to yourself and put very good ingredients inside what you're doing. If you start and see that the first uh, ingredient is sugar, the second is vanilla, then natural uh, flavors, artificial flavors, colorings, and other stuff, then you, you, you can be suspicious as to the true intentions of your manufacturer. But when you see that the ingredients are cacao, milk, and sugar, that's a good starting point. I think that's a really good point, Max. And I think as more people are trying to understand what they're eating and consuming and putting into their bodies and reading labels, you know, that's a great place to start even with your chocolate. Chocolate is to flip it over and things are in the order of, of most to least, right? So whatever the first ingredient is, that's what's mostly in that chocolate bar. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't, you don't need too many ingredients. You have to consider one simple fact is that our chocolate market and the whole industry was built around very bad cacao. Very bad because people didn't know how to prepare it, because the farmers didn't have the necessary infrastructure, because the, the, just the transportation from Africa to Europe took two or three months. So the industry found themselves with a raw material that tasted really very bad with lots of off flavor. So they had to come up with a very heavy processing and very heavy additions in order to make a palatable and cheap product. Now we are at another level. Well, we are not the, the generation after World War II. We are the generation after the, the, the yuppies. We are the generation of the internet and, and so forth. So we can afford to know and deserve to receive a better product. And the industry is slowly uh, keeping up with that. But in the meantime, it's the small chocolate makers that have been providing uh, good chocolate to this new public and, and big so, struggle to keep up. And so you mentioned, Max, you know, we've got this good chocolate. You mentioned that Rizik uh, prefers foil to paper in their, um, in their wrappers. So we had a question of, you know, why is that preferable than paper, foil over paper? Well, because a chocolate is very hygroscopic, so it would tend to to absorb any type of, of humidity or flavor from the outer environment, basically. So we want to keep it protected. Okay. And uh, you know that the particles of flavor tend to become esters with, uh, with fats very quickly. So a bad flavor, bad smell coming from the outside will bond in a very solid manner to the molecule. So it, it will be just basically a, a waste. Is, so another question, going back to the Dominican Republic and, and the areas there, is there a region that is known for like a sweeter cacao than others or specific flavor notes, or does it really have to do with kind of more of the microclimates and the, the agriculture that year? They have to do with the microclimate, but I would say that in this specific case, the, the, the bitterness or, or of the cacao depends on two factors. First is the genetics what is the basic flavor of the bean of the tree itself that was harvested and then the fermentation because there are some 
one type of bitterness that comes with, with the cacao and you cannot get rid of it. And the other type of bitterness, which is basically linked to some types of polyphenols, which can be mitigated through fermentation. Uh, in other terms, I can tell you that the clearer, the, the lighter in color is the cacao, uh, the, the less a bitter it will be naturally. And then the longer it ferments also, the, the less bitter it will be. This is, this is a rule of thumb. There is one type of cacao which in uh, before 2010 was, was called the Criollo type, which tended to be much lighter in color. Now we know that Criollo is not, is not a, a genotype or just a description of, of color. And, and that type of cacao can be fermented really very lightly because it is naturally free of, of bitterness. So Esther has a really good question um, about storing chocolate. So we buy this chocolate and now, you know, we might eat some of it now and some of it later. Um, and hopefully at the end of this presentation, folks are going to um, go to the website and order some. So how do, how, what's the best way to store it? Cold versus out at room temperature? What do you guys recommend? Well, it, it really depends on where you live. If you have the chance of living in Bogota, Colombia, you can store it anywhere. Uh, if we, on the contrary, if you are in a place where you have huge variations of temperature, the ideal thing would be to put it in a wine cellar. In a wine cellar for, for, a, for red wine, which is around 18 degrees Celsius, and keep it at that temperature, but never a fridge uh, or a place where there is a huge gradient, a huge temperature change. What about the cacao market right now? I mean, it's kind of volatile times and 2020 has been a rough year. So what's the cacao market been like? Well, uh, let me tell you that this pandemic has shown that our market and uh, all the people that are involved is a very noble one and very, very resilient because uh, of course, some people took a hit on that. We also, with our store, that was not perfect because the store is based on presence of people. People could not go around. But all considered, we have uh, we have survived and are, and are thriving. And it's not just us, but also our fellow chocolate makers have kept buying. Uh, we have helped each other a lot. We gave discounts and uh, credit facilities to all of our smaller customers. And uh, the big guys on which we depend from the other side also have been very helpful for and supportive. So we have all made a step back and we have uh, all the each other's hand and we're going forward with lots of optimism. Well, so similarly, hopefully when COVID um, subsides and in a better day, we'll all be able to travel again. And so Kim wanted to know, can we visit you guys and actually take a tour in the Dominican Republic? Yes, of course. Yes. Yes, you can definitely um, visit us. I mean, obviously now we have um, certain travel restrictions, but we do have tours available on our chocolate factory in Santo Domingo, which is a smaller one, kind of more tourist version. But we also have tours available on this actual farm that we spoke about, La Esmeralda, where you get to walk through the plantation, see the entire process, and you can make your own chocolate bar as well. Um, I've also, pro I'm projecting also this slide so you guys can also follow us on all, on all social media uh, where we're always posting new information on new products, on the company, on the brands that we handle, and um, where you can also see, well, on our YouTube channel, you can see so much content uh, regarding the team, our process, including some interviews with um, cacao farmers. So be sure to check those out. I've also added um, down below here our website and we created a, a coupon code for everyone attending the webinar today where you guys will have a 15% discount on all orders. You just have to make sure to enter the code at checkout. So. Oh, I see someone says I'm from Brooklyn. Well, our, our store is in Williamsburg. Um, so the store is open. So whoever would like to visit the store in New York, you know, feel free to do so. The store is open. Um, it's only closed on Mondays, but other than that, we're open from Tuesday to Sunday. And uh, there's a small chocolate factory on site where we produce all of the chocolates in New York. So you guys can speak, you know, it's, it's, it's quite an experience. I mean, you can speak to the actual chocolate maker and see the process 
and you know taste all of the amazing varieties that we have available in the store. Well, thank you to Daisy and Max. Um, we're at time. Thank you for everyone for bringing your wonderful questions. Um, and, and thank you again to Daisy and Max and Rizek for talking to us and sharing your knowledge today. Um, and Christmas is right around the corner. Um, so early, early ordering in anticipation of that with the 15% discount today is a fabulous idea. Let's all save a little money and get some chocolate in the process after learning some more about it. So. Thanks for everybody for joining today. And again, thank you uh, to Max and Daisy for, for joining us today and, and teaching everybody about Rizik um, and cacao. Thanks to everyone for, for you know, all the questions and of course to Brittany and, and Humana for having us. And you know, this is a topic that we love to talk about, not just because of, you know, it's our line of work, but it's so sweet, isn't it? <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Cheers.